so I'm sick with the flu. I haven't been out of the house in five days. I have a nasty cough, and I'm bad in need of a haircut and a shave. I think it's time to build a computer. So my buddy spent all of his money on computer parts and not any on a case or cooling. My goal is to take parts that I have around the office, like this old Lee and Lee that's dented, tore up, and very sad, and try to make him something that looks nice enough to put his fancy parts in. So this will be a fun weekend project, as long as I don't throw up. It's going to take a little bit of elbow grease to get this old A05 looking good. But after ripping out a couple panels and parts and pieces and giving it a coat of paint, I think it's going to look real nice. It might be a little frustrating starting from with a chassis like this, but in the end I think it'll be worth the investment. Everything in the chassis is going to revolve around the water cooling, so it's good to start planning early how it's going to fit inside the case and how it's going to work. I think that I'm going to have this radiator bracket here. I'm going to stick my radiator here with the barbs facing the CPU block. Then I'm going to have the pump mounted on the outside facing into the computer. It's going to go through this fan hole and then that way the reservoir fill top will be the highest point in the entire loop. So it'll be easy to bleed. I have some parts on hand for water cooling already. I have a bracket, a copper radiator, an assortment of fittings, a lot of fittings, a copper water block, and a pump. This particular pump is a Lang DDC. I'm still going to have to buy a few parts, but this is enough to get me started. It was time to get a better look at the case, so I decided to tear it down. I just took a screwdriver and some time and got all the panels off, my old wiring undone, and pretty much everything I could disassemble. After I had all the pieces stripped, I needed to get rid of all the old tape and carbon fiber and glue that was on the case. So with a big powerful heat gun and a lot of time, I just heated everything up and then peeled everything away. Even with the tape off, I still had to clean the chassis. I used goo off to get all the residue from the sticky stickers, and I also used some Windex just to get the metal nice and clean. This is really important because I want to paint it and I don't want anything peeling. So what I want to do here is I want to test fit everything that I'm going to have to drill for. So that's going to be how to mount the power supply and the radiator. Because anything I have to drill or modify or bend or cut, I want to do before I start painting. This isn't the power supply I'm going to use in the final build, but I need to figure out something for how it's going to be positioned to fit my radiator bracket. I know I'm going to have to trim it, and it looks like I'm going to have to remove about a quarter of an inch. So a lot of modders recommend that you purchase a Dremel for one of your first tools. And a Dremel's great, it's really versatile, but I don't really actually use mine for really anything anymore. It's sitting right over there on my, my pegboard. I really recommend an angle grinder. You, they're, this model right here, this Drillmaster one from Harbor Freight, um, they're normally $19, but I've seen them for as low as $12, and I've actually bought um, one for, I think, even less than that with a super coupon. And the second tool I'd recommend, which I'm going to use in a bit, is a, is a good drill. Don't get a cordless one. Get a real corded drill. Like, this DeWalt, this is a little expensive, actually, but to be honest, you could go buy a $20 one from Harbor Freight. And for under $40, you're going to have two tools which are going to last a long time and do everything that you need to do with a Dremel. And this might not look like a very precise tool, but I've cut panels out from my Jeep that are just absolutely beautiful in computer parts as well. It can give you a much straighter, cleaner line a lot faster than a Dremel can. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my metal part that's powder coated black I'm going to take a Scotch-Brite pad, which is what your mom probably uses to clean her sink out with, and I'm just going to scuff up the surface of the paint. This is going to help my new primer adhere really, really, really well. I'm also thinking about gluing this in with aircraft glue rather than using screws to bolt it in. And the reason I want to do that is because I think it will make a much cleaner look. It'll be so strong that everything else in the case will fall out and break after being shook, then the, the glue fail. So that also means I need to get the placement right of my bracket. As with any glue, it's important to clamp it tightly. This particular glue only takes about three minutes to set and maybe about a day to cure. 
Instead of bolting on these rubber body spacers, I decided to glue them. This will further reduce vibrations from things like the water pump. Plus, it'll add a bit of flair. With all my glue set, it's time for painting. I'm going to use that self-etching primer and get at it. So I have opened the boxes and I want to show you what my friend picked out. First is the Gigabyte motherboard, the Z97X, the Gaming 5 series. And I did not know this, but it's official motherboard of BlizzCon. Some Corsair fans. We actually have two two packs for four fans. I think I'm going to use three. So I don't know what to do with the last one. Devil's Canyon i7, the LGA 4790K. Yeah, it's, it's all right. It's okay for a CPU. And what else do we have? Um, a USB 3.0 PCI Express card. And I had to pick this one out to make sure he had one that was actually full bandwidth. Kingston HyperX memory. I forgot how much he said he got. Let's see. I need my glasses to read this. You know, that's funny. It doesn't actually say. And a solid state drive by Samsung. This is the Evo 850 series, which just replaced their 840, which are, they make great drives. And this is a 500 gigabyte one. And he has some other stuff coming still. Um, some enterprise storage drives, four terabytes worth. Um, a SAS backplane that we we'll have to put in the case somewhere. And of course the graphics cards, but we'll save the best for last. They're not there here yet anyways, and we have a lot of work to do. So what we're gonna do first is set up everything on my test bench. Well, I guess I'll switch the camera over and we'll go over installing the CPU. This next part is really boring if you're an expert, so skip ahead a couple minutes if you know how to do this already. I'm installing the motherboard on my test bench first. I'm only using four posts because that's all I need for this. Screwing it in tight, and it's worth noting that I like to install the motherboard in my case first before putting the CPU cooler on to avoid anything warping or cracking or breaking. For the CPU socket, I actually did it wrong in this. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to open up the socket cover and line up the little gold arrow on the CPU to the little arrow that's indented on the socket of the motherboard, like this. This part I did right. And then when you lower the socket cover, the little black cap will pop out. So you don't actually need to take it out beforehand. You can do it this way, just be extra careful not to bend anything. I'm rotating the corners of the stock CPU cooler so it will actually pop into the motherboard because sometimes in shipping they rotate the wrong way and then you just won't get it in. So just check it real quick. Plugging it into any of the fan ports, but I chose the CPU. For the memory, just pull the little tabs back and if you install it correctly by lining the key up in the motherboard socket, the little tabs on the end will actually click into place. If they don't, you didn't do it right. Verify that you can't see any little gold pins when you're done by double checking the socket. Now, usually when I install my power supply, I don't. I use my test power supply first and then if everything is perfect, then I'll use the new power supply after it's passed all my benchmarks. I'm just going to stick in the new power supply. I'm sure it's good anyways. I've been saying this for a long time. If you have a problem, it's always the power supply. Unless it's something else. Okay, it's time to plug in my cables. This is a 24 pin. It has a group of two in the end, but the one piece is going to go into the motherboard. And I supported the back of my motherboard because I didn't want to crack it by pushing too hard. And the split end goes into the power supply. This is the SATA power cable, plugging the SATA Molex into the SSD. And next I'm going to plug in the CPU power cable. And the two groups of four go into the motherboard. And then the one group of six goes into the power supply. Next I have my SATA data cable, which I plug into my SSD. And I looked on my motherboard to find where the SATA six ports were. And in this case they're on the end. So that's where I'm going to plug it into. 
Well, everything's up and running. I haven't done any benchmarks or anything yet, but just having to download a lot of Windows updates. About a hundred years worth. So I'm gonna go work on something else. some liquid cooling parts that I want to use but um, they've kind of been sitting in my drawer for a while and they definitely need to be cleaned so I'm going to disassemble them as much as I can get the little o-rings out and then I'm going to boil some vinegar and some water and clean them up okay as my room gets messier I get closer and closer to being done I took off the motherboard from the test bench took off the motherboard <laughs> Anyways, it's here on my anti-stack mat right now, and I'm gonna put the water block on. And the reason I do it this way is I like to do it in two stages. Firstly, when I'm putting on an aftermarket heat sink, I like to get all the screws, everything lined up, it all on the board installed, but not super tight. Because I find that most aftermarket heat sinks will warp the board if you just install it with the board out of the case. So once I got everything lined up, then I'm gonna install it in the case and then I'll tighten everything down. That way the board will stay nice and straight and we don't have to worry about any damage to the motherboard whatsoever. I have my water block, which I got cleaned up very nicely and put back together. Here's my anti-static clip. I don't use paper towels because they leave little bits of fiber in the socket. I like the microfiber because it will completely clean everything up. So I got lucky and I found a back plate for some other water block. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take off these studs, which fit perfectly. And I'm going to trace out this inner silicone jacket. I'm just going to be extra lazy and do it this way. So I used to spread my thermal paste out across the face of the CPU, but I found that using a pea-sized amount was better because you can troubleshoot if your block made good contact or not. My back plate was all assembled, so I installed it on in the back of the board as carefully as I could and installed the CPU block on top of it. Now, this next part, I put the springs and the socket cap screws on the top and I lightly screwed them all down because after I got done putting them on I wanted to tighten them very slowly and very evenly at the same time um, again not so much that I was going to warp the board just enough to have a good contact because later I'll put it back on the bench and then tighten it down right now I'm checking to see if the board was flexing at all and it wasn't the board, um, it looks gorgeous. I really like this board. I probably will get one for myself, and the block looks nice on top of it too. It's gonna light up red with that little LED for the hard drive light, and I think it's gonna look pretty cool. So with the CPU installed, it was time to put the motherboard inside the chassis. I carefully lowered it inside the depths of the chassis bowels. I didn't want to scratch the matte black paint, so I was extra careful. I had to do some clever maneuvering, but you know, it actually went in pretty nice. I didn't want to use normal screws, so I actually found these really cool black thumb screws, and I think that it makes the install look a little bit more unique. It certainly does look kind of cool. I'm, I'm actually happy with how it's turning out so far. Well, it's getting late and I want to go to bed, but there's one more thing I have to do. I gotta get the radiator and the fans installed in my bracket, and then I'll call the night. I had purchased some stainless screws that already fit the radiator, but after putting them in the radiator, I, I hate how they clash with the black. So I decided that instead, try this kids at home, that I was going to mod out myself some black oxide screws that I already have. These are socket head caps and they look awesome. I'm really glad that I put forth this effort, even if it means that I didn't get to go to bed for another couple hours. Where's Mary Poppins when you need her? So for the build, I'm putting the pump on the outside of the system. The guy I'm building this for, he loves using his computer, 
but the hardware is, I mean, he doesn't really know much about it. So I need to keep this as absolutely as simple as possible. And by putting the pump on the outside, he's gonna be able to drain it and he's gonna be able to fill it really simply. So to leak test the pump, I'm gonna be using distilled water. It's very important to use distilled water. I'm also gonna use it to clean out the loop when I start running it later. Now, I actually didn't get this part in video, but what I do is I boil some hot water, and after it stops boiling, I put my tubing in it to set for a while. Then it becomes soft enough to not only bend into the places I need to get it bent, but you can also form it for some really tight angles. This tubing I'm using is from Home Depot, and it just costs 15 cents a foot. I've used it for years, and it works pretty good. Here's the distilled water again. I'm going to run it through the radiator and the water block several times to get all the junk out of it. It's so loud right now because the pump's not bled. There's a lot of air in it, and when there's a lot of air in it, it makes a lot of noise. But once it's fully bled, it'll be dead silent. Really, I just have to drain and fill and drain and fill until all the little air bubbles are gone. It's going to take quite a few iterations. So the drives finally arrived in the mail, and it was time to start taking apart the cage I had for them and paint it. I hit it with the self-etching primer and paint it the same color as the case, that awesome flat black. And This time I'm assembling it with all black screws and hardware, so it's going to look really sharp and tie in with the rest of the build. I'm actually quite pleased with how it turned out. This has a SATA backplane so you can hot swap the hard drives, which is a nifty little feature. I think it adds a touch of class to this system. It actually took a little bit of doing to install it in the chassis because the screws didn't let it slide in, so I had to assemble it inside the chassis one piece at a time. But I think the look was definitely worth the effort. Okay, so I have most of my hardware kind of where I want it to be, so it's time to start the wiring process. And I'm gonna start with some of the custom wires, like this power supply plug that I'm gonna stick in the back. This is going to take me hours to kind of figure out and get perfect. So of course, one of the most exciting parts of any build is the graphics card. And for this build, we're using two of my very favorite graphics cards that you can purchase right now. You can already look at benchmarks online and do comparison tests and power consumption. But I want to talk about why this graphics card is special for me. In my case, as you can see, it's not gonna be butting up against my hard drives. I'm gonna have plenty of room for cable management. Not only that, the exhaust isn't gonna be dumping right into my hard drive bay. It's gonna be dumping out to the middle section of the case where I can easily exhaust it with a fan or through another design. Another thing that I really love about this, of course, it's compact size, are my mini ITX cases, such as my S4 that's coming out. It fits in the S3, and so when I'm able to put premium top of line graphics cards in a really portable uh, mini ITX case, that's that's a very big deal for me. And it's just and it's just drop dead gorgeous. I love them. It's my favorite card. I highly recommend an anti-stack mat to protect your components against ESD. Crossfire doesn't use bridges like these anymore, so we can have a much neater build that's simpler to install. You will need two Crossfire compatible graphics cards. You also need some screws to install the cards into the chassis. Finally, you're gonna need some power connectors. These graphics cards take two 8-pin connectors. I'm using a 6-pin connector that has a plus 2 dongle on the end. If you don't have a connector that's compatible, manufacturers often include adapters like this double 6-pin to 8-pin connector. I don't need this. Now that we have everything we need at hand, let's get started. Start by identifying at least two 8x PCIe slots on your Crossfire compatible motherboard. Next, identify the geometry on your graphics card which corresponds to these PCIe slots. On the left, you have the PCI Keeper tab. On the right, you have the Power Port. The long one in the middle is for data. I recommend taking the PCI key and aligning it with the chassis first. This will make everything else line up much easier. When everything's lined up, you can put pressure on the graphics card, and if you've done it right, the keeper tab on the end will snap into place. Notice how I didn't press hard enough for this graphics card. For this top graphics card, the keeper tab does snap into place, indicating I installed it all the way. If you find yourself having problems installing an expansion card, I really recommend that you unscrew everything else and then see if it will fit. Finally, we have to plug in our cables. 
The cables are keyed so you can't plug them in upside down, unless you press really hard. Notice how I'm combining a 6-pin and a 2-pin dongle to form an 8-pin. Line them up, then stick them in. Once the expansion cards are installed correctly, I'll reward myself by peeling off the protective tape. Mmm, OCD relief. This is the point in the build where if everything works right, it will turn on and it won't explode. Well, the PC looks nice and all, but that doesn't mean anything if it doesn't run well. So I'm gonna install the drivers, configure Crossfire, do some benchmarks, overclock the CPU, and then I'm gonna game. Just for fun, I wanted to see what the motherboard's auto overclocking feature would do. It, it, it didn't go very well for five gigahertz. With almost no effort, I was able to get the CPU at 4.7 gigahertz, and I confirmed it with Prime 95. Later, I can work on getting the CPU clocked even higher, but right now it's not a top priority. After downloading the newest Omega driver from AMD.com and installing it, Crossfire was automatically enabled. I'm going to disable it for now because I want to run my benchmark with just one graphics card. Okie dokie, so we've run the benchmark one time with Crossfire disabled. Now we're going to enable it. I'm going to right click on the desktop, hit AMD Catalyst Control Center, then we're going to hit the Performance tab. AMD Crossfire X, and then enable AMD Crossfire X, and hit apply. The screen's gonna go black for a second, and we're good to go. As simple as that. So I'm gonna close this off, and I'm gonna run my benchmark. Even under full load, the system only draws 460 watts, and stays quiet and cool. So our overall score with Heaven was 1369 with Crossfire enabled. So that's almost double what it was with our single card. But we're gonna run it one more time and we're going to see what it looks like overclocked. So I have a couple benchmarks right now with my app, but I wanna overclock the cards now. And to do that, I just have to use the AMD Kellis Control Center. It's real easy and allows me to enable graphics overdrive with the click of a button and punch in my values. I'm gonna punch in 20% for the power limit and 20% for the GPU clock limit. And I gotta do this for both cards. And 20% is pretty much the cap for this application. I'm gonna hit apply, and we're gonna see if we can run it without it bombing. And there it is, I'm gonna hit benchmark. And now we wait and see what we get. It's pretty quiet. The loudest thing in the whole system is the enterprise drives, but it's really hard to get those things quiet. They just make a bunch of noise. In addition to being quiet, the graphics cards and CPU are overclocked 20% yet still only draw about 500 watts total. It goes to show you that power supply calculators generously overestimate, and it comes down to quality more than quantity. So I wanted to go over my benchmark results with you guys really quickly, starting from the top. Um, with no overclock and with only one graphics card enabled, my score was 699. With my CPU overclocked to 4.7 gigahertz and Crossfire enabled, I almost doubled my score. But it goes to show you how powerful Crossfire can be because it scales really, really well now in most 3D applications. And then finally, with the 20% um, overclock on the graphics cards, again, this is an overclocked graphics card already from the factory and I overclocked at 20%, we saw <laughs> a 20% increase, which is good. This, this shows everything is working like it should. The max FPS for Crossfire unoverclocked was 105, and 20% overclock was 125. So it shows you that, that everything scales really well with these new drivers and AMD graphics cards. This application suits me just fine. It tells me everything's working like it should be. The system is running cool, quiet, and stable, and it's going to be good enough to hand off to my friend. Well, and finish the system, and you know you're finished after you remove the warranty void if remove stickers from your system. <sighs> Anyways, I think it's time to take a well-deserved break, play one of my favorite games, and break this puppy in. I just said break twice in a row, didn't I? I bet your computer can't handle this game.
ball joints are a little loose, but it's fine. We're fine. Stop being a backseat driver. Come on. Eighth place, baby.